Thank you. Hi, everyone. Sandra, thank you to you and to all the volunteers for the friends. The good work you do. The, um, the talk tonight, this is my latest book, and it was kind of a, a culmination of my life's work, all these true survival stories over the years. I got to know these survivors that I interviewed and began to see patterns emerge of how they got through the ordeal. So this, this was the result. I've been thinking about this book for many years, and then when the pandemic hit, I had all these audio recordings, interview notes. I had the time to put it together. So I, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I, a lot of people say, oh, did you know you always wanted to be a writer? And it's like, no, nah, I was a lousy student. In fact, I wrote a, a memoir about all the trouble I was in as a kid. It's called The Waters Between Us. And the name signifies the waters between my father and I, how different we were. But if you've got a late bloomer in your life, there's hope. Because <laughs> that's, that's what I was. And all the, in the waters between us, all the stories, are, they're of an outdoor nature where I'm getting into trouble, sometimes physically, sometimes with the police, sometimes with my father. But that was the pattern. And then a, a family tragedy is what made me become a man. And, kind of understand my father. But before that, I had been doing mostly uh, books with the New England focus. I did uh, co-wrote a book on King Philip's War with Eric Schultz, and then I did a, a novel about the war. It's a, it's a love story between two Native Americans, fictional, but all the events are true. And so I found, oh, you're doing a lot of serious topics. You've got to lighten it up now and then. So I did uh, this book. There's a porcupine in my outhouse, <laughs> Misadventures of a Mountain Man Wannabe. Because at the end of The Waters Between Us, it ends with me buying a cabin in northern Vermont when I was 22 and trying to live up there, you know, off the land, make my living as a wildlife photographer, and failed miserably. <laughs> so a little bit like Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods. And so on this side, I brought all my books today, so this side, there's some books at half price and even at five dollars, because as Thoreau said, I now have a library of 700 books, 675, which I wrote myself. <laughs> um, that's, that's my case in my garage. And then more recently, um, I've been getting into these uh, World War II stories. So I did some for the, the middle readers, and they're on that little section of the middle table. And then I found, boy, just as many adults are buying these for themselves as our middle readers, so why not do a couple hybrids that young adults could read and adults, so a little more hefty book. And this is the newest one. It's, it's an abandoned ship, but it's the strangest World War II story I've ever come across, and I'm just amazed nobody seems to know about it. This, this British ship the size of the Titanic, 3,000 souls on board, gets torpedoed. And I had access to the U-boat commander's war diary. So you get insight what's happening on the ship sinking from the survivors and what's happening on board the U-boat. But just to throw in a couple twists, the U-boat commander hears shouts for help in Italian so he knows, oh my God, there must have been Italian POWs on this British ship I just sunk. So now he and other U-boats are rescuing the very people that they sank. Then the story gets stranger. These three U-boats, the, the decks are just wall-to-wall -wall people. You could only stand like this with so many survivors. A U.S. plane comes by, see what's happening. They ask for instructions, and the instructions come back, sink U-boat. So you can imagine the series of strange events. And then the last half of the book is about two lifeboats, one with 55 people and one with 62. Uh, only a handful make it and how, because uh, they had to go 700 miles just drifting. So it, it becomes a, a survival story. So there's the World War II aspect, the strange. It was covered up. That's why I guess none of us have heard of this ship like the Titanic. It was called the Laconia for any of you World War II buffs that heard it. And then last but not least, 
my very first book is here, local book, Exploring the Hidden Charles. And tonight's special is you buy any two books, you get this for free. Because <laughs> again, my garage is <laughs> getting filled. And I do a newsletter once a year. If you would like to get the announcement, here's the sign-up sheet. That's for that half of the room. Here's for this half. Now we'll get going with the slides. You could just keep that going as we do the talk. I will read a couple parts from Extreme Survival. Normally I don't do that, but it just with this particular book it feels it feels right. So I'm hoping that um, we all learn something because I certainly did from this because this is the subtitle: Lessons from Those Who've Triumphed Against All Odds. And as I'm interviewing these people, some are from history that I didn't interview, I researched, but most are people I spent a lot of time with. I began to think, wow, that could be helpful when I'm in a jam, not life and death, but just faced with adversity or going through some event that we all go through. Um, so I grouped the chapters by the mindsets survivors use to get through the ordeal and not give up. Because most of them, I would go, I, I would have given up. And I'd be like, how did you keep fighting? And they would tell me their little secrets. So the 12 chapters are grouped by those strategies or mindsets. Uh, there's usually three or four survival stories in each chapter. Um, and then I, many of the people I interviewed, I said, these are great stories to myself but they don't cut it for the book because I wanted multi-day events. I didn't want just like a two-hour survival ordeal because maybe most of us could get through that or luck could get you through it. I wanted something where it's all on you, you're alone usually, and you gotta go through this day after day. So that's, that's most of the, the stories. So the first chapter, is something I heard over and over from survivors, extreme survivors. I would say, how'd you do it? And they said, it was overwhelming, so I just broke it down. I go, what do you mean? And they said, for example, one gentleman said, I just took it hour by hour, and I said, I'm just gonna focus on whatever I can do the next hour to stay alive. Then I'll decide whether to fight on or give up. And he would start stringing hours together, and pretty soon it turned into a three-day survival ordeal, and he, he did make it. So they, they broke it down into just those little steps, asking themselves, how can I improve my situation, not wasting any time as, I can't believe I'm in this mess, can't believe the mistakes I made, woe is me, they, they leave that for later, you know, when they reflect back. So these two, I thought I'd start with these two because they're both from Massachusetts, both these, these men. So Brad Kavanaugh, he was, um, he was in a sailboat with um, four others that uh, got hit by a storm, capsized, the boat sank, they end up in a, a Zodiac inflatable. And I'm gonna read, his story was so, just made my hair stand up, I thought I'd open the book with it. So here's Brad, I got to know him a little later after the, the event, we were talking about Wareham, Mass. Uh, he's from, from Wareham, born, yeah. So, so I, I thought his story was so compelling, I'm, I'm, I opened the book, it's chapter one, first sentence. The five shipwrecked survivors clinging to the 11 foot inflatable Zodiac were in the trough of a 30 foot swell and looked up into the green walls of water. That's when they saw the sharks. Brad Kavanaugh, age 21, could clearly see three sharks, and one was larger than the Zodiac. Quote, it was bad enough seeing how large the shark was, but even worse was that the shark could clearly see us, Brad recalled. So you can imagine, you're, the waves are so big, and you see the shark looking down at you. This shark knew there was life inside the life raft, and it wasn't about to leave. From the moment the sailboat he was on, named the Trash Man, sank, Brad made up his mind he was going to live. He thought of his mother and how his death would crush her, so he said to himself, I'm going to take this as far as I can. 
And because this is now my world, my reality, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to fight to the end. So in that one little quote from him, there's a lot of survival strategies. One, he's not in denial. He says, this is my, my reality. Two, he's thinking of not just himself, his mom. And then three, he's got that mentality of, I'm going to take it as far as I can. And the other gentleman you'll meet in a minute, Ernie Hazard, some of his words were almost the exact same to me. So their mindsets were so similar. So later, there was a documentary made about Brad's ordeal. And this is pretty accurate, Brad said. The sharks were circling when the waves went down. There's um, five of us in there. And he said, by day three, we were so dehydrated, two of the guys in the raft started to sip seawater. Not good. Uh, but I, I can only imagine how hard it is. You're surrounded by water, and you're dying of thirst. So he said, um, I told them not to. They still did. And, and the sodium will dehydrate your brain. So about six hours later, the hallucination starts. And one of them suddenly goes, I'm going to get some beer and cigarettes. And he steps out of the raft. And right there, the sharks were. So Brad has to go through all that. And that's when I was asking him, so how did you not succumb to that? And he said, I had made that vow. I'm going to go down to the very end of my energy before I give up. And he said, then the second guy sipping seawater said something similar. So two uh, of the five, that was the end. And um, in this part of the documentary, they showed them sipping seawater and Brad trying to stop them. But then the next slide is a real slide from a Russian trawler that found Brad and just one other survivor still alive in the little Zodiac. So you can imagine how crowded this was when there were five people. Now it's down to two. And her name is Deb Kiley. And later, she makes a very good point that I'll, I'll bring up for all of us to learn from as well. So the other survivor who I lumped with Brad because of the similar mindsets, he's featured in my book, Fatal Forecast. His name's Ernie Hazard, grew up right down the road in Kachichuit. And um, he and another vessel were hit by a 100-foot wave that generated from a storm. I think two waves joined into one. And um, there were two boats. One was the um, sea fever that you see here. And ironically, that boat, they had a fatality as well. That, that boat was owned by Bob Brown on the left who also owned the Andrea Gale. So he owned the perfect storm boat and he owned the fatal forecast boat. What are the odds? But he was a, he was, a, yeah, get out of the boat business. But he was a, I've thought about doing a book about him because he was such an interesting character. As I interview commercial fishermen, his name comes up time and time again as he's passed away, but as having been the most successful commercial fisherman in the Northeast. But his, his son, Peter Brown, was on the boat that day. Bob was not. Mm. And so I got to know Peter quite well. And that, that is the last slide of the Andrea Gale, Peter told me, before it left and was never seen again. We don't know what happened to it. You know, in the perfect storm, mm. Sebastian Younger speculated as best he could, but we don't quite know the last moments. For his fatal forecast, we do, because there were survivors. This is Ernie's vessel, 50 feet, steel hulled boat. Here's Ernie. He was 32 years old at the, the time, um, had tried different jobs, loved this one. He said, uh, loved being a commercial fisherman. And even though the other guys on the vessel were younger than him, he was the newcomer, um, but, but loving the job. But he said when the, um, when the storm came up, he said, first, by the way, shows how hard it is to, to do this job. They And some of the survivors, as I got to be friends with them later, said, well, for authenticity, why don't you come out with us for a week? And I'm like, no <laughs> way, a whole week? 300 miles out to sea and be trapped? I, and I used a line that I learned from survivors. I said, good survivors don't like to be trapped. And if I'm out there and I'm not having a good time, seasick or whatever, 
you guys aren't going to bring me in. There's no way. I went one day, and that was enough. <laughs> it was hard work. But they said the waves at 6 a.m. were already over 10 feet, even though the National Weather Service is saying maximum seas of 6 feet at George's Bank. And part of the reason they were so wrong is the weather buoy at George's Bank had been hit by a ship and was malfunctioning, and the National Weather Service never told these sailors about that. So this was a huge lawsuit. The first time anybody had a successful case against the National Weather Service, uh, later overturned in the Supreme Court. But um, the waves increased by 10 feet every hour. So 6 a.m. if they're 10 feet, by noon they're 60 feet. But yet the boats were doing well, big streaking seas breaking on them like this shot. And so that's not from the fatal forecast storm, but it does give a good representation of what it might have been like for Ernie. He said, so you could see one wall of water bigger than all the other waves coming. I said, what'd you guys do? He said, we tried to climb up it. But he said, it was so big that it broke on our bow, spun our bow this way, so now he said, we're coming off the wave bow first. The bow buries in the trough. The wave picks up the stern and pitches it over the bow. They call that pitch pulling. So you've capsized end over end. And it, they're trapped upside down in the vessel. I'm cutting out a lot of the story, obviously, but Ernie's the one who, who makes it out. And he said, at first I found a bucket. He said, there was so much foam and crashing seas, I couldn't get a decent gulp of air. But a bucket, I turned it over, trapped air in it, gave me a little height you know, in the water, and I could breathe. But he said, I could see the boat drifting faster than I could kick with the bucket. And he said, the most agonizing decision he had was, do I let go of the bucket to go with the boat, or do I stay with what's keeping my head above the foam? And he thought, my best hope of survival is with the overturned vessel, and he was, he was right. Because he let go of the bucket, kind of body surfed and swam back to it, and on the other side of the overturned boat found this life raft, self-inflated, still tied to the boat. He thought he'd see his three crewmates inside. It's empty. He crawls in. He doesn't want to untie it from the boat because they may come out. But he said about 25 minutes later, he looks out and the boat's slowly going down and it's going to take him with it. So he had to untie the line and now the wind just takes him tumbling. So he's inside the life raft. You can imagine, it's like being in a washing machine because uh, the waves are so big. And all he's got on, by the way, the wind had ripped off his um, sweatshirt. All he's got on is a pair of jeans. And this is late November. <laughs> so. I, I should have said that early on. The late November part is pretty important. So he's got so many factors going against him. And um, I tried to visualize what a big wave would look like. And in my book, A Storm Too Soon, this is from that book. You can't, the, the wave is so big you can barely see the life raft. See the little circle there? That's the life raft with survivors in it. So that gives you an idea of what Ernie was going through. And it wasn't until I saw this photo that I realized just how insignificant him and his life raft were. So he had all these decisions to make. Some of them, the big one was the bucket. Another one was, he said, should I lash myself inside the life raft? Because it's every now and then I'm getting tossed out of it. And that's my only hope is the life raft. And I remember I spent a whole week at his house. He had moved to California. And he said, uh, I almost did, but then I thought, what if the life raft does a 180? Then I'll be upside down, lashed inside. I'll drown in my own life raft. And he said, sure enough, about an hour or two later, that's exactly what happened. But I didn't lash myself in so I could swim out, crawl inside the broken ballast bag. So he had to make a lot of decisions and get 100% to live. He couldn't get like a 99%. But his biggest decision were his thoughts. And he said, my thought early on was, I'm probably going to die. 
So you don't have to have this positive thought all the time. But he said, no matter what, I'm going to go down fighting. He knew the odds were long, but he said, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to die fighting. So he's made that, that vow. And he's actually talking out loud to himself. And three days later, the seas went down, and they found him. It's a miracle they found him. So a plane spotted the life raft. They sent out a Coast Guard cutter. The cutter sent out this little launch. I interviewed the man at the wheel on the launch, Tom McKenzie. He said, so we're pulling up to the life raft. And I'm, you know, I've been told no one could be alive because you're off the charts in late November. So I thought we'd see four dead sailors in it. He said, so as I pulled up, I put my hand on the life raft to steady myself. So the doorway opened up. And there was this guy with a black beard. He said his skin was a blue, like purple color. And he said, I almost had a heart attack because I never expected anybody to be alive. And uh, Ernie said something like, what took you so long? <laughs> uh, but this, this picture, there, there's Ernie coming back. He's wrapped in blankets. And I remember I called Ernie up and I said, hey, Ernie, I found a picture of them bringing you back to the cutter. Do you want to see it? And he goes, I don't think I can handle that. Uh, doing the interviews was enough. So it, even though he never had what we would call post-traumatic stress, there were still some parts that were really difficult. And then uh, this was kind of a funny part in our interview. His vital signs were bad. The cutter's going in. A helicopter's going to come and get him. And he said, they wanted to put me in that basket. He said, well, what little strength I had, I was fighting them off. And I'm like, what's the big deal of getting in the basket? And he just looks at me and he goes, try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, you know, it's got that little cable as thin as your finger, and it's going to put him over the very ocean he's fought to get out of. And then later, as I got to know him one night, he goes, I'm sorry about that. I'm afraid of heights, too. <laughs> 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 That's why I snapped at you. Uh, so it, that was, uh, he was one of the survivors I probably spent the most most time with just because uh, he's off the charts. He shouldn't be alive and it shows what your uh, mind can do over your body. So that power of little steps, it's good for all of us. We feel overwhelmed, break it down into attainable tasks. I do it with books because the book feels overwhelming. So I try to only focus on the chapter like a mini book and then celebrate when a chapter is done and then take a break. And then uh, Ernie said, and others have told me this too, they're giving themselves pep talks even for the smallest of accomplishments. So like he found a way to sit in the life raft where it wouldn't tip as much and he'd go, good job Ernie, keep it going. You know, he constantly, and I think that's a good technique for all of us. Sometimes we're looking for praise from the outside when we, got to come from within. Don't count on it of others noticing. So the second chapter is about people uh, thinking they're, they want to give up. They don't want to live. They want the pain to go away. But they decide, I have a bigger reason to live beyond myself. So Hugh Glass was a mountain man, I'm going to describe, and Alexander Donnett was a Holocaust survivor who I'll describe their mindsets. So with Hugh Glass, remember the movie The Revenant? Um, that, that was based on Hugh Glass's real story where he was attacked by a grizzly, he was mauled, and they figured he was going to die, but they weren't sure, so they left two other mountain men with him to watch over him and then bury him if he dies or try to get him to safety if he lives. Well, those two guys go, he's going to die, let's leave him, we might as well take his gun and his knife. He lives and he crawls like something like 100 miles and then is able to walk the next 100 miles. And he said what kept him going was to let the world know that these two guys left him there and took his gun. And he said, he wasn't joking, he goes, and I wanted my gun back. Um, so the Revenant is kind of a fictionalized version of this true story. And then so many Holocaust stories that I read, 
they said they wanted to survive to tell the world about the atrocities, that it'd be much easier to die quickly. And um, you know, when you see like this next picture of the starvation of the Holocaust people, it's so hard to watch. But they were like, people need to know what happened so it doesn't happen again. And Alexander Donnett said, I'm going to hurl it in the face of the world. And I'm going to live no matter what. And now we're switching gears to more modern times. This gentleman said, I actually did kind of give up my the tears were falling. It's another ocean story. In the book, it's mountain climbing, ocean stories, you name it. But he said, but then I thought of the one person in my life who needed me. And he said that gave me renewed hope to fight on a little longer. And that was his 14-year-old daughter. And he said, if I didn't hold her mental picture in my head, I, the tears would start falling and I'd give up. And his story is, in the book Overboard, his boat with four others on board comes off a wave like this and does a complete capsizing, but comes up around again. Then another wave hits it and it does another. So they figure this boat is going to sink any minute. Windows are shot. He, while he's trying to get in the life raft, the third big wave hits and capsizes the boat, hurls him and the captain into the ocean and the three others stay on the vessel. So the story diverges there. But just for the sake of Locke's story, the captain actually dies in his arms. And he then decides, you know what? I can't, it's his friend, I can't let you go. I'm going to bring your body home. So that gives him a reason to fight on. And then when he does finally give up, he thinks of his daughter and he gets another reason to fight on. So there he is, he made it, all those days and nights just treading water in the ocean. Um, and there's his 13, 14 year old daughter. So Locke has become good friends. He's one of the few survivors that actually will get up with me in front of a group and tell the story. And at first when I met him and we're both in tears, I go, we don't have to do this. And he goes, no, this is therapy for me. Finally to tell the full story, and to get it all out in these sessions. So every, every person's different, but for him, talking about it was cathartic. You think adrenaline is great, but sometimes it makes you do rash things. Um, if you've ever been lost in the woods, I have. And night closing in, you feel like running because you, you don't want to be trapped in the woods at night. And that'd be the worst thing to do. You could break a leg. So you want to tamp that down and kind of, you know, kick into neutral. Uh, adrenaline will get you in trouble sometimes. And even in the corporate world, it got me in trouble. I can remember I got an email I thought was kind of uh, nasty and condescending, so I fired right back. Turned into this big brouhaha. All I had to do was not respond, let my adrenaline die down, look at it the next day, and I would have given a much more measured response. So, you know, it's, it's, the adrenaline will kick in and make you do hasty things, and I've seen that. I did do a book on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, it's called Above and Beyond. It's about four lesser known events that almost put us in nuclear war, but in it, I discovered Kennedy secretly audio recorded every meeting he had on the crisis. So hours and hours of audio tape of what we're deciding to do. And thank God he let his adrenaline go down because the first two days he's in total agreement with the generals. We're going to bomb the hell out of Cuba, take out every missile site, every surface to air site. And then by day three, he's starting to think, this is going to lead to nuclear war. And the generals are all pressuring him. We need the element of surprise. We got to go today. And he's pushing back going, no, um, I need more time. And that's when he came up with the blockade idea as a step. He still was considering the, the bombing, but he wanted to see would the blockade idea work. This was from one of those black box recordings. It's funny, I did this program last week and one of the people in the audience said, I met this pilot. He goes, I know exactly Haynes. Uh, 
The co-pilot goes, we need all the help we can get. And the pilot goes, won't this be a fun landing? So he's trying to inject a little humor to diffuse the tension. Kennedy would do that in his meetings too, by the way. And then the co-pilot goes, whatever you do, keep us away from the city. And the pilot goes, I'll write your pilot certificate if we make it. And then he goes, when we make it. So he's trying to give this co-pilot that confidence that they can do it. I'd say of all the disasters I've researched, blinded by the goal would be right up there with sticking to a schedule. And sometimes they're, they're one and the same. But I've learned goals are great to have, but the plan to reach the goal should be really flexible and adjust it as information's coming in. An example is these hikers I researched going up Half Dome at Yosemite, or climbers, they're not doing the, the face of it, there, there's a way up. While they're going up, it's two experienced ones and three not so experienced. While they're going up, others are coming down, the people coming down go, don't do it because dark clouds are coming in and you know, up at Half Dome, you're the highest point, this rock. And um, the, the newcomer was like, good advice, let's turn back. And the two, quote, experts are like, no, we're almost there, we can do this, we've done it before, we'll be fine, big mistake. The, the lightning at Half Dome, when it rolls in, it just hits it. And they were hit by lightning. And he, the survivor, had a good quote later. And he says, I'll never relinquish control to others again. And it's because he felt that peer pressure. He's part of this five-person group. The two experts say, let's go on. We've done this before. The two others are in agreement. And you feel the pressure to, well, I signed up for this. And he's kicking himself saying, I should have should have turned back. And then along that same line is questioning the experts. I'm going to tell one serious story and then a funny story involving myself where I didn't follow my own advice, um, especially on vacation. Because on vacation, you let your guard down. You're so pumped to do stuff. And I met this fisherman named Donald, and he got a He's a wealthy guy, he had a mega, mega fishing boat uh, with all the e pervs and survival suits. But when he went to the Bahamas, he wasn't with his boat, and so he went with a guide who he assumed would do the same. But what happened was, on the way back, they, after bone fishing, they run out of gas. So Donald goes, where's the spare tank? And the guide goes, there is none. And Donald goes, well, Let's make the cell phone call and let people know where we are. And the guy goes, there's no service out here. And what happened was the sea started building, the waves picked up, the wind picked up. And he was lucky to make it to the next morning. This is when he was finally found. They're sitting on the overturned boat, but totally hypothermic that they can't move. And it was all because he was on vacation and made the assumption that the local expert knows what he's doing and don't do it. And then now I'll read my stupid story of uh, being on a mini vacation and falling into uh, the same trap of letting your guard down. If I can find where I clipped it in here. <clears throat> okay, so this was a, uh, a working vacation I took to Puerto Rico to speak to the uh, Coast Guard Air Station about lessons I learned. So a program very similar to this that I put together a while back. And um, so I was at this place, La Jolla Beach. The snorkeling did not disappoint and I stayed along the sheltering rocks and the swimming felt nice and easy. And well it should, a current was taking me along. I hardly noticed the current because of the beauty of the colorful fish below me. I had a mask and snorkel on, but no flippers. Then where the rocks ended at the open ocean, I tried to body surf some waves back to shore, just like a couple of surfers further. That's when I noticed the current was exceedingly strong. A wave would propel me forward, but then the backwash would take me right out again. 
After five minutes, I was making absolutely no progress towards land. I was being carried by the current parallel to the beach, and by stroking hard, I managed not to be taken further offshore, but I was growing tired and basically just holding place. Had I been smart, I would have hollered to one of the surfers for help, but I was embarrassed to ask for assistance and kept thinking, just one more minute and I'll be out of this current. I didn't think it was a riptide, but I now started swimming more parallel to the shore instead of directly at it. After another five minutes, my feet touched bottom and I was able to rest on a sandbar. Then I swam for shore and this time the current was still strong, only now it was taking me back towards the rocks where I first snorkeled. It was like being in a giant eddy. I finally made it to shore, and as I lay panting on the sand, I counted all the many things I had done wrong. Perhaps the biggest mistake was that I entered unfamiliar waters when the ocean waves were enormous, and most stupid of all, I was all alone, and if I were dragged out to sea, no one would miss me. Wait, let me rephrase that. The Coast Guard, who had hired me to discuss decision-making and safety <laughs> would have noticed that I didn't show up for my talk the next day. By that time, I'd be halfway to Spain. <laughs> so, so it's a mistake we all make, and um, I've done it a couple times on vacation. So don't trust the local experts. I follow that story up with another guy who went, um, uh, I guess it's hang gliding with an instructor. The instructor forgot to buckle him in. So now the guy's just hanging like this. And amazingly, for 10 minutes, he was able to hang on by his fingertips. And it's because he didn't even check. Did they buckle me in properly? So there's a lot of psychological studies on survivors, and they say the best survivors are those who are kind of got an independent streak or a maverick. And I think that is true because a lot of the people I interview certainly fit that mold. People raised to be good aren't the best because they're kind of going along to please others instead of trusting that gut feeling, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you have the option and it's the situation at some degree of risk, choose the decision that's reversible because you can always bail out because good decision makers will bail out. They don't like to be trapped. And bad decision makers think or say things like, I've come this far, I might as well get to the top or finish this, even though new information's coming in, saying change your plan. Um, when I used to coach basketball for kids, the younger kids would dribble into corners. I go, don't do that because you're trapped. Good decision makers don't want to be trapped. All you can do in a corner is pass. They're probably going to pick it off. I say, go to the top of the three-point line. You could shoot. You can pass. You can drive to the hoop. So this was the woman who was with Brad in that raft where the guys said, I'm getting a beer and cigarette. Uh, and I love what she said, a list of pros and cons is not always as important as whether it feels right. And what she's referring to is none of it felt right to her before she got on the vessel. And she tried to get out of it, but the pressure was, come on, you signed up, we're counting on you. But she, she didn't do it because she couldn't articulate why she had a bad feeling about this trip and vessel. And later, after the accident, she said, now I realize what it was that the captain was an alcoholic and there were some clues I was getting something was wrong with him. But I couldn't, at the early stage, put it all together. So my definition of intuition, and there's, there's Deb Kiley, is um, it's not mysterious, it's subconscious clues that you can't yet articulate yet. You don't know where they're coming from, but I'm now a big believer in listening to them. Later, in hindsight, you probably know where those feelings were coming from, but at the time, you're not sure. And it can work the other way as well. For example, uh, 
people saying, no, don't do that, or that makes no sense. And a couple times I'm like, no, everything feels right to me. I've prepared, this is the right time. Like when I left my corporate job to be a full-time writer, <laughs> everybody said, you're nuts. Uh, you're walking away from a good deal, but everything felt right. And I felt like, okay, I've done the prep work. Um, so I went by my gut, and so now I never do lists of pros and cons. Uh, I trust that inner feeling. Then I thought, well, some of these survivors got lucky. There's always an element of luck, but usually in the ones I've decided to put in the book, there's a little luck, but it's mostly what they did. But this gentleman, this author, had an interesting uh, study, and he said that you're not born lucky or unlucky. It's all how you view things. And he, he was pointing out that good people who think they're lucky, they're kind of on the lookout for opportunity and good things. And then he took it one step further and he said, and the luckiest people are the ones who aren't afraid to then act on it. Whereas others are like, oh, I don't know, they hem and haw. And, um, and then if you, so if you feel like you're an unlucky person, try to make that switch to thinking you're lucky because all the studies have shown that it's good for your health and you'll live longer. <laughs> so, so even though it may not be a real thing, luck or unluck, it is in your own head, it's a, it's a way of thinking, it's an attitude. This one I debated, should I do this chapter on people who heard voices? And I wasn't gonna, but then like pretty major survivors, these three in particular, all heard voices. And I was like, and I'm hearing it from people I've interviewed, I should put it in. And I don't know where those voices are coming from? Is it from the stress of the situation? Is it God? Is it something else? I have no idea, but it was happening so often as I interviewed people that I said, I, it needs to be a chapter. So Slocum, he's the first guy to circumnavigate the globe alone in a sailboat. Um, he said at the worst time, at the worst storm, somebody appeared on his bow and gave him precise instructions how to get through this, this worst piece of the entire uh, global passage. And Joe Simpson, he was, you might have heard this story, he was the rock climber who fell and slid down a crevasse and shattered his leg and his partner assumed, you know, he fell so far that he's dead, couldn't even see him and left, but he wasn't dead and he starts to crawl out of this crevasse, you know, using the pick, going a foot at a time. He said, clearly there was a voice. It was not in my head, it was not me. It gave me instructions of precisely what to do whenever I wasn't sure. And he said it was loud and it was not me. And again, I've heard it too many times and even when Somebody like Shackleton, one of the most famous survivors and best leaders of all time, says something similar, you have to listen. And Shackleton's experience came at the very end of the ordeal. He and two others had to go for help because the rest of the crew couldn't walk anymore. And they had a long trek over the ice. And he said the whole way, I felt the presence of another being and these encouraging thoughts were zipping into my mind at times. And he said, when we got to safety, it was only then that I asked the other two guys, did you feel anything out there? And they described the exact same sensation. So there's a whole uh, theory around that. It's called the third man factor. There's always a, an extra person with you. So th it was Shackleton who made me say, you know what, I'm gonna do a whole chapter on that because too many of the people I'm interviewing are saying similar things. Uh, being, you know, like Brad, he knew he was in serious situation, but when you hear everything is under control, your antenna should go up and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is my warning and I'm not gonna listen to experts if, I, if my gut's telling me otherwise. And a good example is, do you remember this is a few years back. Isn't it funny as we get older, everything seems like it was just two years ago? <laughs> the Costa Concordia, that big Italian liner, 
hit the rocks. Well, the captain gets on, the intercom tells everybody everything's under control. Thank God it was a passenger and she thought, the ship is listing, We're, I feel it. This is not good, I'm gonna call the Coast Guard if he won't. She saved a lot of lives by making that call. Mm. And then the ship did go over and who was the first one off when it went over? The captain. Um, so it was, uh, he was in denial. He could not believe that by kind of showboating, he's gone so close to shore, he hit the rocks, that this giant ocean liner was in jeopardy of going over. Right. But that's, that's what happened. These survivors would uh, try to take the things that they thought were out of their control and you know, push them aside and not think about it. So. Again, going back to Ernie Hazard, we're sitting at his house with a beer, and I go, you know, you're out at George's bank, you're in that life raft, there's a lot of sharks there, weren't you worried about that? And he just goes, Mike, give me a break, that was the last thing on my mind. He goes, I was gonna die from drowning or hypothermia, it's late November. <laughs> and I thought later, what a good way of looking at it, because he couldn't do anything about the sharks, and they're probably, they are attracted to life rafts. I've introduced so many people. The sharks just, it's a structure, they come to it. But he had no control of it, so he said, I, he even joked about it, he said, they were welcome to me. I had much bigger concerns than sharks. And then Amy Racina, she was hiking and fell off this cliff, shattered, both legs and uh, she's worried about the flash flooding potential because she's down in this ravine. And she's like, can't control that. So she's looking at the power of little steps. What can I do? She said, why don't I try going 10 yards? Because she knew the trail she fell off of, nobody would find her because very few people were on it. And she knew there was another trail that was more well-traveled not too far away, so she set her sight on that. And she said in her book that she did it in 10 yard intervals and put together two full miles and, and made it. And then here's a, an interesting story, I'll see how I'm doing for time, happened just last night. I figured I'm gonna call this survivor I wrote about but never interviewed. I just researched his story, his car went off a cliff, he got trapped in it, uh, the car crunched on his legs so he couldn't get out. And he's way down a ravine. Nobody can hear him shouting for help, so he's, he's trapped in it. And he did what I thought was great resourcefulness. He starts taking the ceiling of the car apart and he finds some wiring up there. He takes the wiring out and he can see out the window, there's a trickle of water like 20 feet away. And he ties his T-shirt to the wire and uses it like a fishing pole and dips it in the water then brings it back and brings the water out into his mouth and he survived 16 days like that. But so last night I finally called him and he said there's more to the story. He said, I didn't know it at the time but I had a major back injury and at the hospital later they said, had you gotten out of the car you would have died trying to walk out. Your back actually fused back together in those 16 days, and that's what helped save your life. So he was like, the very part of being trapped, he did lose part of his foot, but he said it also saved his life because they said, what happened to your back is remarkable. And he said, they would have, had I done that and gone to the hospital, they would have kept me, you know, in traction or you don't move. He said, basically in the car, all I could move was my arms. And so it was an interesting phone call. So I'm always learning new stuff. I did ask him, has your life changed in any way, having gone through that terrible ordeal? And he said, no, I'm still up for a challenge. And then I said, I would have never made it. I would have never figured out the wiring and I would have given up. Why, would, why did you make it since I never interviewed you before? And he said, I don't know, and then I kept pressing him about his background. He did, then he finally said, well, I was a Green Beret and did go through the training. <laughs> that, uh, that helps. It, uh, so it was, you know, you have to keep digging. And he said that helped. Yeah, his name was uh, Johnny Vitalik. And then 
another woman from Massachusetts, Mary Rowlandson. She's in uh, my book, Until I Have No Country. She's captured by the natives while other people are dying in captivity. She's so smart, she's making herself useful to the natives. She's knitting hats for the kids. She's uh, helping gathering firewood, anything to get a little more food because they're all starving at the end of King Philip's Indian War. And she makes it 11 weeks of captivity with just remarkable toughness. We're almost at the very end. Two final people, Howard Blackburn, he was in a dory, got separated from the mothership. He's freezing. You feel his body freezing. So he puts his fingers that are frozen into claws around the oars. He just goes to himself, I'm going to row until I drop towards land. And he, he makes it to Nova Scotia. The guy with him gives up, and he goes quick. But I always thought incredible, remarkable that he just has this mentality until I drop. He did lose his fingers, but the story gets better. He doesn't let this stop him in any way in his life. He later goes on, here he is, and he crosses the Atlantic Ocean twice all alone in a 22-foot boat. Can you imagine going back in the ocean that almost took your life? And on one of those, the second passage, he breaks the world record from going from America to England. So just amazing. He was from uh, Gloucester. And then John McCain, his secret was uh, steady strain. In other words, don't get too high when you hear rumors of release because he sees the people's spirits plummeting. And that really jumped out at me because in abandoned ship, this one about the Laconia, you know, the 3,000 people on board, in one lifeboat, only four out of 55 made it. And the one who made it, I was just reading this before the talk, he said, we were dying, literally dying in the lifeboat when we see a ship go by and we're going to be saved. He goes, the ship didn't see us. He said, so many of the people in the lifeboat, he said, that was the moment they gave up. He said, one man who he had grown close to just stepped right out of the lifeboat, started swimming away. He was, he was done. He said others started sipping seawaters. Others just lack of will died the next day. So he said we went, just because of that one ship, he, we went from 12 survivors left down to the final four. And, and I wondered, why did he make it? Why didn't he get real high? And sure enough, when I read later about his life, he had been on another ship that was sunk by a U-boat earlier, so he knew just fight for as long as it takes, that same mentality as John McCain. So seven years of captivity, and McCain, he had a pretty special life afterwards as well. So Shackleton, he mixes humor in to keep people going and just doing your best. In my lesson, I'd be a fool not to have learned from all these people I spend time with. And early on, you know, because I've been doing this for 30 years, I began to think, I'm kind of living for the future. I keep thinking I'll be happy when this goal is reached or when this happens. But that's the wrong way. You don't know how long you have, and you don't know if that goal will ever be reached. So you're pinning all your hopes. You're trading the sure thing of today for the uncertainty of tomorrow. And I said, I got to get rid of that way of thinking. And so my new phrase is, thank you for putting me on the path too. So you still have goals, but if you don't make it, that's okay. You're enjoying the journey that you're trying to, to get there. There are some videos of the survivors on my website. My daughter put that together of all the different books. So final thoughts, we're probably tougher than we all think we are because we're all worried about change, but our whole lives have been changed. So we've already got it through it. And then I kept thinking, what about those situations where we have absolutely no control? And it was the Holocaust survivors who said it best. They would say they could take away everything from us so that felt like I had no control. 
but they couldn't take away our reaction or our response to what was happening. They couldn't take away what was deep inside our, our mind, and that, that's what kept them going. And then I'm going to close with, at the end of Fatal Forecast, I said to Ernie, I wrote the book, and you, you know, it's me taking what you've told me and putting it into words. Why don't you have a couple pages and just say whatever you think? And so I extracted these three little lines. He goes, these are free years I'm living, so I don't let the little stuff get to me now. And when bigger problems come along, I figure somehow I'll solve them. And that makes sense. He's out, you know, if you've been in the North Atlantic late November, in and out of a life raft. And then he closes with, I now appreciate the little things and been thankful for each and every day. So that was how he changed, just a very subtle switch. Thank you. Thank you. So people ask me, would you be a good survivor? And I go, ah. I, I don't have the technical know-how in those situations. A lot of the survivors were really resourceful, like the guy who takes the wire from the car. That would have never occurred to me. You know, just, my brain isn't wired that way. So I think I'd fail the test on that account. On the other accounts, you don't know probably until you're in it. Um, but you just, I do know that that power of little steps, that works. You're putting one foot in front of another to get there or, or to get through whatever it is that's gone wrong in your life. You're letting time pass. But question or, or comments? That John McCain one, it always pissed me off when Trump said, oh, he's no hero. I go, God, he spent seven years in, uh, as a POW. That's given up part of your life. And he could have been released early, too, because his father, I guess, was a, a bigwig in the Navy. Yeah, so they offered him an early release, and he goes, no. It was uh, remarkable. Yes? That's more sense of purpose. Like with this book, you know, I said, okay, there's some purpose to doing this book. I'm going to, you know, maybe touch a life or two. And I did. Uh, I, would, I got an email from somebody who was going through long COVID, and he said, I'm using a highlighter in the, in the book, and it's helping, you know, just to get through this ordeal. So that was a, the big difference. I, n I never felt there was a sense of purpose there. It was kind of like, Making the rich richer. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, regarding those tests that were guiding, um, how do you assess their guidance um, if you work for adults and work for young, young adults? Probably because I think like a 12 year old, <laughs> <laughs> have the maturity of a 14 year old. But what I found was they want to get in the story really fast. So I'll give you, a, here's a perfect example. There's three books on World War III here, and there's one that was, this is written by Doug Stan, hit number one on the New York Times, huge hit about the Indianapolis, the ship that went down. So he said to me, would you write the young adult version? And I said, no. And then he and the editor came back, said, you know, we've decided you're the one to write it. And I said, no, and they're like, why? And I said, because I'm going to cut the hell out of his book and he's not going to be happy. And then so he called me and he said, no, I've read your other ones for young adults. I won't look over your shoulder. And he was good to his word. He was a great guy. But the difference is, so in his book, the ship sinks on page like 120. In my book, it sinks on page 12. <laughs> so for a younger reader, and I'm finding for adults, they're, they want the ones get into the action faster. So that's my main trick and remove some of the, the extra details that an adult may enjoy, but a kid would find is slowing the pace of the story. So that's, that's the biggest difference. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Because it was something from a significant personal degree to each kid. So ah. I'm wondering if anyone told you that that worked for them. 
Some of them, yeah, some of them did. Others, it's funny, both uh, Ernie and Locke had a similar comment. They said, I really didn't pray too much out there because I knew it was all on me. I was going to give prayers of thanks later. And Ernie turned it into a joke. God has bigger concerns than me. But, but that's how he viewed it. He's like, no, this is on me. I got to be thinking, thinking, thinking every hour to get through it. But others used the power of prayer, and they said it helped. So everybody's, everybody's different. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of that one. They actually, they weren't just devout kids. Two of them just walked out, you know, and um, they said, I I assume that you guys didn't actually run out, but the guy at the end, um, he really gave to everybody. I remember he was so angry. Nando Parada is his name. Yeah. Yes, and for the most part, I was very surprised they didn't have the PTSD. Um, a couple did, but most did not. But that is an amazing story. And his, there's two books on that. One was um, Alive, and then, but then Nando Parado wrote his own. I forget his title, but his was even better. Mm-hmm. And, the, and he was talking about how people were giving up, and he's like, no, I'm, I'm going to just start walking. It took him forever, mm-hmm. but yeah. So you just, you don't know. Well, I had uh, some coworkers that were in uh, <coughs> in college uh, when I was on mission. And uh, you know, just a handful of survivors and they were down there reading the Psalms. And so, um, and uh, they took the stairs all the way down. All the way, d- yeah. Right. Um, these two guys were haunted um, for years after they came out that they were seemingly um, uh, you could only hear them as they just took the stairs. Right. Um, and they were they had difficult difficulty making their way home. Um, one of the stories. So the survivor's yeah. guilt, kind of. Yeah. You think? They, yeah. They just didn't know. Am I allowed to make this on the stairs? Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. So it was, yeah. Did they, you know, I'm curious, did they, because one thing I read was talking about getting instructions. There were instructions in some floors over the loudspeakers. We'll let you know when you should leave. Stay at your desk for now. Yeah. Yeah, where... I'm sure some of them, their gut feeling is maybe you smell smoke, just go. Um, but, you know, sometimes we, that peer pressure, it might be your manager saying, we've been told all to stay, go, you know. But that is interesting that it became almost debilitating for them. It, it, it did disappear after a while, but yeah. Yeah. Really really right. But I find it, for me, switching books up, it drives my agent nuts because they want only the books that they know are going to be successful and those are these true survival stories. But I'm like, no way. That I've just completed that serious book, so now I'm doing a fun book about my garden and it's called There's a Groundhog in My Salad. <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> the first chapter was in the Boston Globe magazine last weekend. <laughs> Because uh, it's just, yeah, if you only are researching serious stuff, it's going to pull you kind of in that way. So this is a lighthearted misadventures of a vegetable gardener, and the groundhog is the first of many battles. So it's it's it is good to mix it up, but most authors don't do that. They stay in their lane because that's what works. But I'm like, life's too short to just listen to the agents and the publishers.
Well, thank you all. I hope you take a look at the books. Thank you. Thank you.